You can't be being Mr. Nice Guy in boxing. Nice up. I love to crush bones and spill blood, you know? But I believe that whenever I hit my opponent in the right places, he cannot stay up. Yeah, I can really do damage to your, your body physically and your brain. Eight seconds left. Oh, and that's it. To me, knocking somebody out is like having you know me. Boxer, he's a puncher. Oh. 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 And he's wrong. There he go. Oh, my. Whoa. That's why he's the young master. Gonna... Oh, my God. Hi, I'm Mike Tyson, heavyweight champ of the world. Let's talk boxing. Welcome back to another canonizing video celebrating the biggest one-hitter quitters in the sport of boxing. That power is, man, it scares me sometimes. On today's video, we're attempting to rank the consensus top 50 hardest punchers throughout the 140-year history of prize fighting. They maneuver around the bend of the ring. Now watch, watch. There, that big left, and Willard down. In the case we have here, Jack Dempsey is a very, very vicious man. I've decided to use the tried and trusted tier list format to classify each fighter. And of course, the selectees will be ranked by their pound for pound punching ability, or else Julian Jackson would be the only guy outside of the heavyweights to even have a slight chance of featuring on such a list. I'd just like to say to Mike Tyson, man, you know, I could do it too, you know. <laughs> I've added one extra tier to make things less congested. And while there will be numerous fighters ranked at the bottom, you have to remember they'll only be considered the weakest punchers among the 50 or so greatest KO artists in history. There are no losers here. And uh, I was scared then. I'm only frightened this time. <laughs> There's a lot to get through, so I'll try my best to explain my criteria for the rankings as the video progresses. Okay, he's moving, it's better. Dancing is better. Or maybe he's taller. There's nothing of the first part. To kick things off, I think putting one fighter in each category will help us find a base for the rankings, and then we can just start slotting guys in freely thereafter. Which brings me on to a modern-day counterpunching specialist, Gervonta Tank Davis. A fighter that has been knocking on the door to enter the pound-for-pound -pound list for the last few years, Tank Davis has built quite the reputation of a one-punch specialist who lures his opponents in by setting crafty traps. A smart fighter and a ruthless finisher, Tank has the ability to generate ridiculous power even while he's moving backward. I've created a performance card for a few of the first fighters listed today so you guys can understand my thought process. Only the power stat is relevant for the video, and I believe Tank is one of the best pure punchers of the last decade or so, right up there with coveted figures of the past. Tank is setting a pretty high bar there, but to go one step further, we need a consensual killer that leaves no room for discussion or debate. And who better than the immovable wrecking machine, Big George Foreman. It's the tale of two stories with Big George, as he split his career in two with a 10-year layoff in between. He was a very different fighter upon his return, certainly more presented as an immovable object as opposed to the wrecking machine of his youth. But one thing that never changed was his power. His hands are so heavy that what becomes a knockout punch doesn't always look like one and I think it's going down. George could knock you into next week with a glancing blow. Freakish power generated by such a low amount of torque, he defied the scientific equation for force. But in the end, the raw strength of the man combined with his crafty setups and persistence made him one of the most dangerous men who has ever stepped in the ring, regardless of how crude and against the grain it looked at times. With George in S, let's get an individual in at the lower end, and someone who stands out to me straight away is Chris Eubank Sr. I think there are certain versions of Eubank that could give him a much higher rank. I mean, his ability to clean a clock with a single blow can't be refuted. But due to multiple circumstances, one including a tragedy in the ring, he gradually lost that killer instinct and became more comfortable with winning over the distance. You are mine, you belong to me, I am the man. He lived by the warrior's code, almost a self-hating discipline to a degree, as he welcomed taking his licks more than the average prize fighter, which resulted in him having a slightly underwhelming KO percentage considering the knack he had in his younger years. Overall, however, still a solid puncher that I consider one of the most dangerous around the 160-pound weight limit. 
and this gets done to him by a bunch of cowards at ringside that never took a punch in their life. I'm sick of it. It's impossible to rank iconic fighters like this without ruffling a few feathers, so we might as well get a big one out of the way right now with a legendary heavyweight champion from the pre-war era, Jack Dempsey. Once considered the most notable face across the entirety of the United States, even more so than the active president of the time, Jack Dempsey was a major deal in sports entertainment post-World War I. Dempsey has now become the biggest thing on the sports landscape, including Babe Ruth. While boxing was already a mainstream sport during its early inception of the gloved era, Dempsey can be credited as the guy who took things to another level, transforming what was often seen as a test of one's wrestling ability as much as their punching capability into a firefight where the goal was just to get their opponent out of there in a fashion that is much more akin to how we see things today. And Jack Dempsey comes out with the most ferocious left hook in the history of boxing, including Joe Frazier's. Dempsey was a savage, unquestionably a big puncher, but more of a high-volume brawler than a one-punch specialist, which is why I think that he's more suited to the B category for now. I might change a few things later, and if I do, Dempsey will certainly only move in one direction. Oh, man, I, I'm crazy about Jack Dempsey because of his ferocious intensity. You know, no one likes him. To highlight the importance of a body of work in my criteria, let's take a closer look at the only fighter listed here with a 100% KO rate, Edwin Valero. Valero is definitely one of the greatest what-if stories in boxing. Despite being a champion in two weight divisions, his career was cut short right around the moment boxing fans were anticipating some high-level, pound-for-pound showdowns that would have undoubtedly certified Valero's legacy for better or worse. In his mind, he thought that he can go out there and just by throwing the first few shots, he would destroy the opponent. And he was right. He was a strong, big punching, high volume brawler who won all 27 of his fights by knockout, with 19 in the first round. Yet, he didn't quite produce a body of work that could force his name to be in the mix with some of the ATGs that will place higher on the list. In 121 professional fights, Robinson has lost only one. To accentuate this list being entirely about punching power, I will slot the consensus goat of boxing at a modest C tier. Oh, I saw him at the best, and he was the best fighter ever lived, pound for pound. Sugar Ray Robinson was the perfect fighter in every sense. You can play out his highlight reel for casual or even non-boxing fans, and his glaring greatness is apparent for all to see. And then, under the microscope of boxing's harshest critics and historians, his resume stands above most, if not all, of his iconic counterparts throughout history. In his prime, the best and the greatest pound for pound, the perfect all-rounder who could outbox the boxers and outslug the sluggers. Perhaps more known for his speed of hands and feet, but he could also turn out the lights on some of the most durable and resilient opponents with a single shot once the opportunity presented itself. No one can touch him, Russia and Cuba and Poland, to anybody on the planet beating them all. Sugar Ray is a rare fighter in the 100 club for knockouts, being the only former middleweight champion in history to achieve this feat. A legend, an icon, a goat. Pound for pound, meaning that I imagine if he was a heavyweight fighting the same style, he'd be the greatest. Now that we've got some of the structure set, allow me to slot in a few guys off the cusp without racking my brains. Alexis Argoyo, an iconic puncher around the super featherweight limit, more of a high volume guy than a one hitter quitter, but a wrecking machine nevertheless. Bob Foster rarely went the distance during his peak as light heavyweight champion in the early 70s. Tall and rangy, he even fancied himself against the likes of Joe Frazier and Muhammad Ali, despite a 30 to 40 pound weight disadvantage. I am so strong. I am so powerful. I'm Superman. Vitaly Klitschko was a man mountain in the 2000s, a true modern day heavyweight who emphasized every inch of his height in the ring. I think of him more for his strength, but he certainly had some pop. Similar sentiments can be made for Vitaly's brother Vladimir. He was more of a glass cannon than his brother, but I would argue he was a technically better puncher in his prime. 
Bob Fitzsimmons was everything Bob Foster was, but he made his power count upon moving up to heavyweight. And by moving up, I mean just weighing the same as he always did, 170 or so pounds, and then just wreaking havoc on guys twice his size. The OG puncher, a real killer during the sport's early years of the gloved era. Lennox Lewis is the best. I laid them all to rest. Lennox Lewis. I would argue a better puncher than the Klitschko brothers, despite his KO percentage being slightly lower. He cleaned out an entire generation of heavyweights. He beat every man he ever faced, and outside of immovable objects like Holyfield and Mercer, all of his memorable nights in the ring resulted in his opponents flat on their backs. A genetic, genetic freak. And I played with boxing, so imagine when I get serious with boxing. Shannon Briggs was a fun heavyweight who certainly left his mark as a decent KO artist, particularly during his rise in the 90s. Admittedly, a bit of a can crusher, but he achieved everything he could in the sport. Let's go, champ. <laughs> Don't be scared, ladies. I'm just in shape. <laughs> Don't get scared. I'm just in shape. I know that there will be a lot of debate amongst the guys ranked from A to E, but I at least want to be sure that everyone is content with the fighters in S, which brings us on to perhaps the most brutal single puncher of all time, pound for pound, Julian the Hawk Jackson. Jackson fought for many years in the shadows of iconic pay-per-view stars of his own time. It wasn't until he retired and video sharing sites like YouTube came around that casual sports fans realized they messed up by not tuning into the boxing until the main event, because this guy was straight murking the competition on a lot of the popular Don King undercards in the 90s. Well, the hardest punch in junior middleweight today. He wasn't the most well-coordinated and had questionable punch resistance himself, but his get-out-of-jail-free card was the most effective escape from an ass-whooping I've ever seen in the sport. But I believe that whenever I hit my opponent in the right places, he cannot stay up. The current light heavyweight champion, Arthur Beaterbeev, has a 100% knockout rate with some decent skills to rely on against the more resilient opponents. He's the only world champion that's in boxing today that has a 100% knockout ratio for every fight he's ever been in. Frank Bruno was a scary man to deal with in the opening rounds. Brutish strength with a remarkable straight right hand, he was built like a Greek god, which didn't really help him as the rounds progressed. Any cruiserweight in the world cannot take my power. Any heavyweight in the world definitely can't take my power. If David Hay had just seen out his last days at cruiserweight, I have no doubt fans would have remembered him as an ATG at that limit. Still, a couple lackluster performances at heavyweight really soured and tarnished the reputation of one of the most explosive athletes of the 2000s. Thomas Hearns was the hardest puncher among the four kings, a true product of the Kronk. It's between A and B for me, but I'll go with B for now and maybe change a few things later. Yes, I would, I would uh, fight more rounds and uh, uh, make him more pain. Sergei Kovalev was an impressive boxer-puncher in his prime, very methodical in how he set up his power punches. A tremendous technical boxer, but a bit of a flat-track bully whose resilience seemingly disappeared overnight. Both Duran and Chavez are boxers I'm worried about ranking here, given the fact they are notorious, skillful pressure fighters that broke their opponents down with an accumulation of punishment. C-tier for now. Next up, we have, as Frank Bruno once said, the most Frank dangerous, Bruno. dangerous Frank. number one hitman in America, the G-Man, Gerald McClellan. For the WBC middleweight championship, J-Bell in the white trunk, he's the challenger and the trunk. And look at this! Big left hook to the body, right in the solar plexus. McClellan was a perfect all-rounder, rangy, quick with a crushing jab and rib-breaking body punches. Jones' power over the hills jab. His potential was untapped until it was unlocked by Emmanuel Stewart of the Kronk, who fine-tuned Gerald's finishing ability, imploring him to follow up and close the show once his man was hurt. You've never been past eight rounds. No, I will never go past eight rounds again. Gerald never forced his work. His power appeared effortless, just a heavy-handed individual. Um, Gerald McClellan, I believe his name, is from Highlights, and he seems like a dynamo. A fighter that I'm sure many people are eager to see place today, for my money, the most popular boxer ever based purely on his talent, Iron Mike Tyson.
Looking back on Tyson's career in retrospect, I see him as almost a lab rat, an experiment by a mad old scientist, a physically imposing kid brainwashed to believe that there wasn't a single man on earth that could compete with him in the squared circle. And I'm just convinced, you know what I mean? I didn't challenge me with their somewhat primitive skills. They're just as good as dead. Tyson was a credit to himself, his coaches, and the sport in general. Everything he achieved in the game was off his own back, dedicating his entire youth to being the most technically efficient fighter in the world, pound for pound. A short heavyweight that packed the punch of a behemoth while delivering it at the speeds of a flyweight. A great combination puncher, left hooks, uppercuts, there weren't many shots Tyson couldn't deliver as well as, if not better, than the single shot specialist throughout history. An incredible fighter whose highlight reel certifies an S-tier placement on even the harshest critics list. We sacrificed so much and we put in so much and I just knew we couldn't fail. Aaron Pryor, an offensive whirlwind that could throw a thousand punches around without breaking a sweat. Raw aggression and crushing power, not many could withstand his onslaught. With a staggering 132 knockouts, the old mongoose, Archie Moore, certainly knew his way around the ring and how to break a man down. Infamous for his technique, the craftiest of all, one of the greatest fighters of all time. In a similar vein to Vladimir Klitschko, Anthony Joshua is a big punching heavyweight who has adapted his style to be more methodical after suffering a KO defeat slightly underrated and definitely a dangerous man to trade with on the inside. A fighter that's been forgotten with time, Peter Maher was the ultimate test for a rising heavyweight in the late 1800s. An old school badass who would go out on his shield trying to land that finishing blow. Looking up and seeing Pryor and Orgoyo together, it's only fitting that we get these two up there additionally. Zorate and Gomez were the hardest punching bantamweights of all time, and luckily for us, they fought in the same era. The 70s bantam and featherweight era was incredible, just unfortunately overshadowed by a golden generation of heavyweights. One trick ponies are underrated, especially when that one trick is as great as Razor Ruddock's smash. As one-dimensional as you can imagine, Ruddock's smash was everything. His jab, his hook, his uppercut, he would lead with it and also use it while being pressured moving backward. Technically, the punch is known as a shovel hook, a cross between an uppercut and a hook. But Ruddock made it his own thing, knocked many foes out with it and dished out some life-altering punishment for those that withstood it. Entirely against the grain, and I absolutely loved it. He punches like a meal kick. Oh my god. Next, we have a man whose reputation has almost become mythological during the digital age, and in my opinion, the single greatest fighter that has ever lived, the Boston Terror, Sam Langford. In my opinion now is the same as ever. I think Langford was one of the greatest fighters we ever had, Ed. And if I'd have fought him, I probably would have gotten knocked out, and I'm glad I never had the opportunity to. In short, Langford started his career as a lightweight, but finished at heavyweight with over 100 knockouts at that limit alone. He fought the most Hall of Famers in history, and I would argue produced the most momentous body of work among all prize fighters throughout time. None of these guys can retain their punch power for as long as Langford could. None of them. None of them can claim the victories that Langford has from lightweight to heavy. None of them. None of them. Jack Dempsey openly admitted to ducking Langford because, as he put it in simple terms, he would flatten me. Similar sentiments were shared by the guys who actually had the nerve to face him, including Harry Wills, who described one of his knockout defeats to Sam as a near-death experience. I genuinely thought I was dead when I hit the canvas. A common argument people use to discredit Langford or other greats like Harry Greb is there isn't enough footage to determine their greatness. My response would be to simply pick up a book or read a few articles. For instance, it's not like anyone with logical reasoning would consider George W. Bush a greater conqueror than Genghis Khan based purely on the fact that there is footage from the war on terror. Regardless, Langford was a great fighter and a murderous puncher. 
But Langford is different to that. Langford took his power up and still maintained the ability to knock big men out, even with single shots, which is quite remarkable and very different to other fighters who've moved up in weight. Felix Trinidad had an impressive run as welterweight champion in the late 90s, knocking out 16 opponents in his 20 world title fights. If he didn't knock you out with the left hook, the follow-up straight right was certain to get the job done. As some of you might have noticed, all the fighters are listed in alphabetical order, and by total coincidence, three heavyweight goats, Liston, Lewis, and Marciano, are all bunched up, ready to be placed together in nothing short of the highest tier possible. Joe Lewis was the biggest puncher of the three, closely followed by Marciano. I'm not sure Liston will make the final cut in S because I was planning on having no more than 10 in there, but let's see how things change later on. When he fought, he basically intimidated the opponent. They were intimidated before they even got in the ring. He was a massive guy. On all circuits, he was just oddly awesome. Jimmy Wilde is a difficult one to rank, infamous for his crazy winning record and ridiculously high KO percentage at flyweight. However, his weight limit was only in its infancy during his peak, so the competition was only really there for him once he was well past his best. And after the second round, I understand it's not boxing. I need street fight. Like, you know, just broke him. Gennady, Triple G Golovkin, oozed a legendary aura from the moment he made it onto the big HBO shows in the 2010s. Cut from the same cloth as Greb, Monzone, and Hagler, but unfortunately didn't have the dance partners to create a legacy or resume anywhere near ATG worthy. A seek and destroy master, nevertheless. At just 30 years of age, the monster, Nyoa Inoue, is a bona fide first ballot Hall of Famer, an all time great with plenty of miles left on the clock to improve upon his already legendary title run. He moves like the wind and strikes like lightning, the deadliest skill set in the world today. Sometimes, scoring a knockout goes beyond the typical variables we think of, such as technique, punching power, or the opponent's weaknesses. It can often boil down to the simplicity of the will to win, the eagerness to close the show, accepting the risks that coincide with maxed out efforts. Which brings us on to the man who knew a thing or two about risk taking, someone who certainly wasn't in the game to play pity pat boxing, the dark destroyer, Nigel Benn. What a bonus for the crowd here in Wisbeach to see, for my money, the most exciting prospect of British boxing at the moment. Nigel Benn in the golden Ben was like a greyhound out of the gates, straight to the point, seek and destroy. That was his ethos, his attitude in preparation, and something he was willing to go out on his shield for in execution. He's come back for more. Not much longer. Admittedly, Ben was less tactically skilled than most of the guys listed today. He was just an explosive offensive whirlwind who relied on his inner fire to fuel him throughout the majority of his career. Fight someone like me who's been fighting all the time and who wants to have a fight with you. Similar to Nigel Benn, another fighter I enjoyed watching back, particularly during their developmental period as a pro, is Tommy the Duke Morrison. Incidentally, as an amateur, he lost the Olympic trials, a big right hand followed up on the left. Despite doing damn near everything he could to destroy his own chances of becoming a top-level pro, such as heavy drinking and slacking off during training, Morrison's athletic genetics persevered to help him fulfill a respectable career, especially given how jam-packed with talent the heavyweight landscape was in the 1990s. During the short time he actually had his head screwed on, Tommy was a great student who was always looking to improve and implement techniques fresh out of the gym directly into the ring. Oh, but I tell you what, I will be a heavyweight champion as well. So boxing fans, watch out. He had a great left hook, likened to that of Joe Frazier, backed up by decent speed for a heavyweight and an honest work rate to keep his opponents on their toes. I've been playing catch up to the Ray Mercers and the Lennox Lewis's and the Riddick Bowes because I never really had the initial uh, uh, experience as an amateur that they did. So I, I've been playing catch up and now I feel like I'm closing the gap just a little bit. Talking of Joe Frazier, I would say he could punch at a level above the Morrisons and Ruddicks of the world. He became an icon and focal point of the most celebrated heavyweight generation in history, with his infamous left hook being the most memorable single shot of that time. Yeah. Were you ever scared of anybody in the ring? Now be honest. I remember Joe Frazier. He was the toughest guy I'd ever seen. Yeah. Smoking Joe Frazier. Hit a guy so hard the guy turned his back. 
If some of the stories that I've read about James J. Jeffries were true, then he would have to rank up here somewhere. But, and it's a big but, how much of it is true? I don't want to backtrack on my rant about why Sam Langford is so great from earlier, but some of the writings about Jeffries appear more fictitious. It was like creative writers of that time were trying to develop a superhero 30 or so years before they became prevalent in pop culture. Either way, Jeffries was unquestionably a force to reckon with during the turn of the century. I think Monzon was the last great middleweight champion, and when I'm done with this game, I would like to go down in history as the same way. Carlos Monzon was THE middleweight champion of the 1970s, a winning machine that retired on a 61 fight on Beaton Streak. He packed a deadly straight right hand. That's what I'm telling you. Featherweights with Prince Nassim when they get hit, it's a whole different story. Prince Nassim Ahmed had arguably the most unconventional style for a pound-for-pound -pound level fighter in the sport's history. He relied heavily on his reflexes and dug himself out of danger time and again with his out-of-this-world one-punch power. David Tua epitomizes why winning a heavyweight title in the 90s was a remarkable feat, despite competing in the alphabet era. The short and stocky heavyweight was blessed with those Polynesian genetics, strong as an ox, and he could knock you out with every punch in the book. You get a great show and then always get spoiled with some BS like this. I've run into a bit of a problem here at the end, with the last five fighters, Stanley Ketchell, Sandy Sadler, Ernie Shavers, Adonis Stevenson, and Deontay Wilder, all worthy of an S-tier placement in my opinion. So I'm going to create an S-plus tier at the very top to at least try and narrow down what I consider to be the very best of the best. The incredible knockout ratio of Jackson. Whoa! Jackson makes it in without question, as does George Foreman. Of the newcomers, Ernie Shavers had cataclysmic power that every heavyweight of his time attests to being the most forceful of that generation, sentiments shared by many historians who all rank him as a top five puncher in history. The best one-punch fighter, the one greatest punch I have ever seen, is owned by a man named Ernie Shavers. The true meaning of pound for pound is if you transfer a fighter's skill set directly into a different weight class, how would that fighter perform? Which is why Sandy Sadler is comfortably an S plus tier puncher, the heaviest handed lower weight fighter in history, with the highest KO percentage among all boxers with over 100 stoppages. Lewis and Marciano both make the cut, and I would make the case that if we can all agree Shavers is up with the best, then so is Deontay Wilder. Wilder doesn't have a first-rate resume, but he has proven himself against a decent level of competition long enough for me to comfortably put him alongside the legends of the past. Because it's gonna come. It's just when it comes. It will do when it do come. Bam, baby. Good night. Now, I just need to rework things a little bit to satisfy my structuring OCD. Okay, and there we have it. The top 50 boxers in history ranked purely on their punching ability. I'm sure there are many of you at home pulling your hair out on some of the placements, but just remember it's only my opinion, and you're free to have yours too by heading over to my X profile and clicking the link at the bottom of my Hardest Punchers thread, and that will lead you directly to this tier list page where you can slot in all the iconic punchers at your own will. Until next time, this has been Puncher Season on Boxing Legends TV. How about you rate your performance? Uh, I'm always giving myself a zero. I'm never impressed. Have you given yourself an A yet? Never. Perhaps never will. Probably never will. That's